Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. We're rolling right into our second podcast for 2011. Uh, again, I have Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the developers of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks again for being on the show. Hello. Yes, we're uh, back here in 2011, the second podcast, uh, getting right back up to speed after we took a little bit of a break in January. So uh, here we are with uh, another interesting topic uh, today. Yes, but before that, you can find us online at www.rce-cast.com. You can find old shows on there. Subscribe in iTunes or get an RSS feed in your RSS reader of choice. Uh, But yes, we have today a guest about what I think will be a pretty popular topic and is a... I've been seeing more and more users uh, at our site use it and request it. Uh, We have Travis uh, Oliphant uh, from Enthought. He was one of the developers of NumPy or Numpy. He can correct us on how that's actually said. It, it said NumPy. NumPy? NumPy? Okay. Yes. Okay, so Travis, why don't you go ahead and give us a little bit of background, um, your personal background, and then can roll right into what NumPy is. Okay. Well, thanks, Brock and Jeff. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Uh, NumPy uh, started basically while I was a graduate student. So I was a graduate student uh, studying inverse problems in medical imaging at the Mayo Clinic uh, and really, really enjoyed high-level language work while I was trying to do uh, image processing, basically, or medical image processing, and uh, found that I was a big user of MATLAB and it wasn't quite enough and had seen this nascent numeric Python work going on, ended up getting heavily involved in the numeric Python community, carried that with me as I took my first uh, academic post at Brigham Young University where I taught electrical and computer engineering, um, ended up doing so much work in that NumPy community, uh, rewriting numeric Python to become NumPy uh, during some of that time. So much of that work kind of distanced me from the academic work. I ended up uh, deciding to go into industry after that and have been at NThought for about three years. Uh, at NThought, we, just, we do scientific computing consulting as well as training and uh, some products uh, in the space of the high-level scientific computing with a language like Python. So, Travis, I wonder if you could tell us, uh, you know, what exactly is NumPy? What's its goal? What does it do? But uh, give, it, give us the elevator pitch of what is it. Uh, that's great. Uh, NumPy basically provides uh, large data uh, capability for Python as well as fast calculations for, those, for elements or uh, information in those large data arrays. Uh, Python has lists and dictionaries. Uh, it also has an array object, but the array object has no calculation functions associated with it, and it's a single dimension. So NumPy is an n-dimensional array with fast calculations attached to it. And why exactly did you pick those specific abstractions? Does this reflect something that uh, you know, Python is natively not good at? Uh, basically, um, in some sense, NumPy evolved uh, from uh, the work of many folks. So numeric Python uh, started in 1995, and it sort of created those abstractions, the the fast calculations called UFUNCs, universal functions, or UFUNCs for short, and the array object, uh, those were already created by numeric Python. Uh, NumPy enhanced those, um, uh, kind of formalized them a little bit better than they were in numeric Python, but fundamentally didn't change anything. And numeric Python really grew out of a lot of other uh, array-like languages, uh, MATLAB, J, APL, uh, IDL. All of these were inspiration for numeric Python. So I guess I would say that uh, those two abstractions have kind of been uh, created multiple times by multiple people through the years, and Python did not have anything like that. So compared to using uh, the straight Python versus using the NumPy um, array objects and operators, how much faster is is NumPy compared to regular Python? That's a good question. Uh, If you're doing a lot of element access, if you're just taking... Uh, elements and wanting to access each element individually and do operations on it from the Python level, uh, NumPy actually isn't going to be faster than using Python lists. Where where NumPy really shines is if you have, say, 100 or more elements in a large data structure you want to do math on. Let's say you have a sound wave uh, that could be considered a one-dimensional array, and you want to do a clipping operation on that sound, uh, or you want to do a filtering operation on that sound. Writing that code in Python uh, versus writing equivalent code that does the same thing in NumPy, you're going to be about anywhere from 50 to 100 times faster in using NumPy. But again, it's for large data sets. So then the big question is, how much better is this compared to writing C or Fortran or C++? 
Yeah, exactly. So it integrates with your Python code much, much e more easily. It integrates with Python code much, much more easily. So uh, you could write C or Fortran. Uh, a lot of people, if they know C or Fortran, are comfortable writing that and then trying to link that into Python. And in fact, when Python first came out, that's how a lot of people did their work. Python was a glue language between other pe people's C code and Fortran code. Uh, a lot more people really prefer to write in that high-level language. It's closer to the way we think. Um, and you don't have to remember as many arcane details about memory allocation and pointer arithmetic. And so NumPy allows you to do that all in Python. NumPy also creates objects that uh, you can think about the problem as a whole. So you can think about the sound wave as a single structure, a single object, rather than thinking about each individual element at a t one at a time, as you would in C or Fortran. So do I infer from that? then that uh, you're implementing these, these algorithms and whatnot in C or, or Fortran or some uh, nicely optimized language behind uh, Python and then providing a nice abstracty high-level interface to it in Python? That's correct. One of the great things about Python is that it allows you to create your own built-in objects in the same language that Python was originally created in. So C Python, for example, you can write a C extension that creates a new object, just like a dictionary or a list or a tuple is an object in C when you're working from the Python command line, the C Python command line. NumPy is an object in C. So therefore, all the methods or all the operations that, you, that work seamlessly with NumPy arrays are in C, and that's how you get the really fast speeds to do what's called vectorized operations over a large amount of data. So what kind of operations do you provide? You said vectorize. Give us, uh, give us some examples. In our, yeah, the idea of vectorization. Vectors? Thanks. The idea of vectorization is really the key for this, uh, the high-level use of NumPy. Vectorization is when you take uh, two objects, like just to say an array of numbers from 1 to 100, and you take another array of numbers from 100 to 200, uh, and the same number of elements, you can just, with one expression, say A plus B, and get another array of the same number of elements where element by element the operation has taken place. So that's a vectorized operation. It's a lot of computation that's done with a single statement at the Python level. Uh, so that both conceptually lets you think of the problem at a higher level, so you're not worrying about uh, for loops and pointer arithmetic uh, when you just want to say, I want to add these two vectors together or these two large data sets together. And then it also allows it to happen much faster because the actual calculations are done at the C level. I think you also asked what kind of functions are available. So there's a, a lot of functions available. NumPy itself provides some basic functions, add, subtract, basically everything in, uh, say, a C99 uh, math library, uh, exponentiation, logarithms, uh, log 1p, uh, multiple, uh, and then all these standard uh, binary operations are provided. Other packages like SciPy provide even more functionality for special functions, um, NumPy itself also provides things like convolution, a basic one-dimensional convol convolve function. SciPy then adds to that and add, takes the same data structure and provides two-dimensional convolution, two-dimensional other image kind of image processing calculations as well. So you mentioned, uh, so you're talking about vectorization in there. That made me think of something else. I'm sure a lot of these things are optimized for uh, what we'd call the vector unit of a CPU or any of these new accelerators or like the Intel LRB project and stuff. Uh, are you focusing on any of this stuff in your C at the bottom? Do you rely on a third-party library? Yeah, another great question. Uh, a lot of we rely on third-party libraries when we can. For example, um, the distribution of NumPy that we ship inside the Nthot Python distribution links against the Math Kernel library, the Intel Math Kernel library, the MKL, uh, to provide fast operations for the matrix multiply or for uh, fast Fourier transforms, uh, but. At the low level, some of the other loops uh, really need to be optimized. They're a great place for somebody to come in and really uh, provide optimizations that aren't there at the moment. Uh, we do just rely on a C compiler at the moment. Uh, some people, I've seen projects out there to try to experiment with OpenMP or with uh, linking against additional libraries. I think some people have even created uh, uh, assembly code. Uh, it really is a pluggable architecture, and you can replace any of the low-level loops that NumPy uses to do the calculation with something else. Uh, you could do it on a GPU, you could do it on a vector machine, uh, but a lot of that work is, are extensions, and, and NumPy itself doesn't currently use any of that uh, in most distributions unless you're linking against something like a BLOS or an LA pack that's optimized. I, I didn't neglect to mention that... 
I did have, like to mention some of the additional packages that come with NumPy. Uh, NumPy itself comes with uh, fast Fourier transforms, random number generation, and some basic linear algebra functionality. And these are the functions that uh, occasionally are optimized depending on the, the distribution you get, depending on who compiled it and what they linked against. Fair enough. So let me let, let me rephrase that and make sure I, I understand what you were saying. So uh, the basic NumPy it comes with uh, basic uh, C kinds of loops. Uh, um, is that accurate so far that you're, you're basically just taking advantage of the C compiler rather than the interpreted uh, Python language? Yes, that's correct. And then there's a bunch of add-ons where people have done various other types of optimizations or, or linking against other third-party libraries and things like that. And um, I, I would assume this is kind of a researchy area where people like to play around and whatnot. Is that, that, that's is right. that also an accurate statement? Uh, so have people done – so I'm going to expand a little bit more on what Brock was saying before. Have people really uh, started experimenting with GPUs and whatnot? Is yes, there much definitely. of a call for GPU-level acceleration in, in, in Python applications? Uh, there is, and definitely people have experimented with that. There's several projects out there that take NumPy arrays and uh, expose those or, or do calculations or comp compilations to the GPU. One, some of my favorite uh, there's the examples of that kind of work are uh, something called Copperhead, which come out of, came out of Berkeley. There's uh, some Pio PyCuda uh, is a project that uses the, the CUDA libraries. And then uh, fundamentally there, it's using NumPy as a data structure so that you know the data is all stored in a certain way and you can access it uh, as you'd like. And then you people create Python-level uh, translators, essentially, from Python code to GPU code. So how much work is... Uh available like can i actually get some of this gpu stuff in the regular numpy library or is there a plan to add it so right now there isn't any of that in the in the standard numpy download um and definitely there's plans to add it although you know it really relies on the volunteer labor of folks so it depends if somebody has an interest in spending the time to make that happen i don't know of any specific plans where people are trying to get that work done except for some of the work that mark weeb's doing uh, he's in uh, British Columbia in Vancouver. Uh, he's a master's degree student. And typically the kind of work that people do, it happens while they're academics. Um, so their master's program or PhD work. Um, and I know that many people are thinking about this, but so far nobody stepped up and really said, here's some, uh, some code that actually does these loops at a low level on a GPU. But there are tools out there that are allowing people to write essentially low-level GPU loops in Python and then those could be exposed or linked into kind of monkey patch, essentially, or, or plugged into the NumPy framework. So as that evolves, I could see in the not-too-distant future uh, NumPy uh, creating, using those very fast loops at the low level. It's really designed for that, but it's just a matter of work to make it happen. And uh, NumPy 2.0, I know that's one of the goals, is to have some of that uh, capability available. It's just a matter of uh, volunteer time and uh, effort and people interested to see if they'll uh, implement those those tools. There's a lot of need for developers on the NumPy project. It, it's got a lot of room for people to plug in and do really significant things to it. So you mentioned that NumPy also provides FFT and a few other functions, but you only mentioned that it, um, like the NumPy that you ship from Nthought links against the MKL, and when you download the NumPy source, you can build against your BLAST library of choice. Can you use any external FFT libraries for your hardware or threaded FFT libraries or any other third-party libraries with NumPy? So you can with varying degrees of effort on your part. Uh, you know, the uh, FFT interface is essentially an, an API, and to, to link against a faster FFT library, you'd have to write an extension module or some kind of Cython code that uh, replaces the FFT call in NumPy with your FFT call that calls your, your fast code. Uh, definitely doable, but, but not really uh, to varying degrees of, of, of difficulty. FFT libraries have a lot of different APIs, and so it's hard to kind of create a universal API to all the FFT libraries. Okay, so you're not shipping any like default interfaces for FFTW or something like that right now? Not in NumPy. Uh, my very first project uh, that related to SciPy was, in fact, an FFTW wrapper uh, to allow you to create FFTs using FFTW. I don't know where that work still is. Um, I think other interfaces exist now to FFTW. Uh, DJB FFT. Um, the MKL has an FFT algorithm. that We also have a version of NumPy that links against that. Um, 
I, but there is, you know, there's many, many people who distribute binaries of NumPy. We have a binary of NumPy that's in the Unthought Python distribution, but there's also a binary freely available on uh, the download site. I think currently it's linked to get, it doesn't link against any fast FFT algorithm. It simply uses the FFT pack uh, code that was translated into C that uh, currently comes by default with NumPy. So NumPy doesn't require you to link against an optimized blast. It has all the code necessary, but it has the ability to link against optimized blasts. Uh, and then there's a few people who have created optimized FFTs. There's certainly much more work that could be done there. Now you're talking about all these different implementations of different algorithms and uh, potentially linking against other third-party libraries and things like that. Is, is NumPy a, a pluggable framework in a conventional sense of plugins, like for my web browser and things like that? I can load one or not load one, or at runtime I can potentially choose between different um, algorithm or different uh, implementations of something, or is it more of a, a developer side framework where I can you know publish my own distribution that has my stuff in it? Yeah, more of the latter. Uh, NumPy itself isn't uh, really pluggable, but Python is very pluggable. Uh, in this, it's very generically pluggable. I mean, you can do very interesting things with Python to create uh, a distribution that looks as if it were pluggable, but there isn't anything specific that that makes it more pluggable. On the, on the blast side, it, it, it is on the on compile time. It's basically a, a command line option to the build instruction. You tell it where, where your packages are. Uh, there's also what's called a setup file, and you can just, in that setup file, much like a make file, put your uh, libraries you want to link against. Uh, but blast, it, it supports pretty well. FFT, uh, not so well. FFTs are basically whatever, by default, the FFT pack. If you want to do a faster FFT, you really do have to, uh, be, as a developer, write that extension and then monkey patch, which is refers to replacing the symbol with your FFT function on import time uh, to make that available to downstream uh, programs. Uh, or create your own distribution, your binary of, of NumPy, and build it against your particular FFT library. Uh, it's not difficult to do, but it does take effort from the developer to do that. Fair enough. Well, let me go back and ask a little something that's near and dear to my own heart. Uh, are there any algorithms that uh, parallelize, that uh, go across either multi-core within the same server or perhaps even use MPI and spread across multiple servers? So only if your vendor library supports that. There's nothing inside of NumPy that, uh, that currently is taking advantage of that. Uh, that's definitely one of, an area of interest. Uh, certainly many of the low-level loops could be parallelized. Uh, there's some work that needs to be done to make that that possible to make that happen automatically, uh, but the MKL linked NumPy that we provide and that you can also get from other sources if you have the MKL libraries uh, does use multiple threads or multiple cores if they're available. Uh, so right now it's basically third-party vendor libraries that NumPy links against that supply that. Uh, but it's certainly there's many places in NumPy where that could be optimized. Just again requires somebody with an interest to make that happen. So you're right now not relying on too many external libraries. So I'm guessing you guys aren't using anything like Swig to kind of quickly kick out a Python interface to some C library. Like you're actually writing all these Python interfaces by hand to make sure they're the the way you want them. Well, so that's that is interesting question. Uh, certainly, when I started working on Python, that was really the way I preferred to do it. Uh, because you could have full control over what you linked against and what C code you called and how you called it. Uh, how, uh, Swig has been around for a long time as well, and I would use Swig, uh, for example, the FFTW library I, I wrote 10 years ago uh, to link against FFTW was a Swig interface. NumPy itself doesn't really do a lot of that uh, because you know, a lot of that's in SciPy. It's more of a library uh, level call. Uh, for a long time, I've, I've thought of NumPy really as just the array object and the universal function, which is the addition, subtraction, uh, exponentiation, sinusoids, cosines, those calculations. But historically, NumPy's also included some basic linear algebra, basic FFTs, and basic random number generators. And so those have remained inside of NumPy, even though there's additional better versions of those in SciPy as well. Um, so it's the linear algebra, FFT, and random number generators along with any other library, mathematical library, machine vision, machine learning, um, image processing, all of these libraries can be, you would use something like either write your own extension module or what's happening now is people are writing a lot of Cython 
uh, modules. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Cython, but uh, Cython is a simple, uh, it's, it's decorated Python that gets compiled to C code. So you've mentioned now Sci SciPy twice, and I know having built SciPy in the past that it relies on NumPy. Uh, just a real quick elevator pitch on what SciPy is, because we'll do a separate show on SciPy. Sure, yeah, and SciPy deserves a, a separate show. It's, it's, it's really a, a large collection of additional libraries to do things like special functions, optimization, more extensive linear algebra, uh, more extensive statistical analysis, besides just random number generation, also getting uh, PDFs. Uh, there's curve fitting techniques and, and approaches. Uh, there's some genetic algorithm uh, start of genetic algorithm. I guess that was actually removed. So, uh, so it's just basically a large collection of any kind of generic operation you'd like to do with data. So, how many other third-party libraries? What are some popular ones besides SciPy that rely on NumPy? Yeah, there's quite a few. Um, there's many uh, scikits dot image processing. Uh, a lot of scikits, which are kind of another way for people to contribute to the SciPy community without having their code go into the larger SciPy uh, ball of code. Uh, people have it, written things like scikits.image, scikits.stats uh, models. Uh, there's pandas. There's uh, Larry. Um, there is CVX opt. Um, uh, a lot of – there's some partial differential equation calculations. Uh, it's actually grown quite large, and I, I haven't kept track of all of them. Uh, but there's a lot of third-party packages that use NumPy. NumPy provides a C API as well, so a lot of the functionality you can do in Python, you can also do at the C level, so you can create another extension to Python that uses some of the functionality of NumPy without going to the Python layer. Okay, so hold on. Let me make sure I understand that properly. Did you just say that... Uh, a C developer can write cool new functionality and you provide the hooks to allow that to be exported into Python. Is that what you said? Uh, basically, a C developer can write an extension that is then used by Python and that extension can make use of low-level NumPy functionality, things like uh, the convolve function or the standard deviation function. And that uses the same code that NumPy itself uses without going through the Python layer. Of course, a C developer can always call Python and create NumPy objects and, and do the equivalent at that, that level, but it, it, it allows you not having to go into Python and back down. In fact, in that point, uh, the refactor of NumPy that was necessitated by trying to create an Iron Python port of NumPy really has created uh, a library version of NumPy that doesn't rely on Python at all, uh, with the idea of it being used as an array object for any dynamic language. And that's really NumPy 2.0. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of things that can be done from what's there now. And I'm kind of excited to see what work will be done over the next six to eight months before NumPy 2 comes out in order to really support that concept of a library-based NumPy. Ah, interesting. So you're saying that you just have a lot of good algorithms. You want to make them available both natively in C and quote unquote natively in, in Python. Is that one of the major goals of 2.0? Yeah. And, and it's the algorithms and, and probably more than that, it's the, the basic data structure that's used and then exposing that data structure to uh, a C level framework anyway that can be uh, overridden with your own algorithms with some default algorithms and then overridden with your own. Um, kind of it's a community, it's a place to grow a large community of basic algorithms that work on a standard object that everybody uses. Now, that raises a very interesting point there. So to, to kind of standardize on your object, you, you would kind of need to be interoperable with other things. So do your data structures play well with others, say like HDF for stable storage and or other numerical kinds of libraries? I, yes, I, I think so. I mean, basically, NumPy is, in some sense, a best of breed of multiple uh, ideas around data storage. Uh, one way, for example, one illustration is that the HDF data storage, uh, NumPy data structures are very, very similar to an HDF uh, file. And so, in fact, we could have made the default storage of NumPy arrays an HDF file. Uh, we didn't do that because nobody stepped up to want to rate that interface to, to connect and really just call the APIs from HDF. Uh, but it's, it was remarkable to me to see the similarity between how HDF thought of data and then how NumPy uh, thinks of data. So you already mentioned that you have a C API so that you can export certain functionality. 
uh, so that C developers can add functionality to NumPy but use some of the parts of NumPy that are already done. What about Fortran developers or C++ developers or any other, uh, you know, CUDA developers for any other low-level uh, optimized language? Yeah, so there aren't really any specific uh, f uh, features there in NumPy itself. In SciPy, the, uh, I guess I shouldn't say that, NumPy comes ships with something called f to pi which is uh, basically an automatic parser of Fortran code that generates an, uh, an extension module, the Python, using NumPy as the data structure to pass back and forth between the Fortran code and the Python code. It is an automatic wrapper generator for Fortran code. Uh, it's quite powerful. It's you know getting older. It's pretty optimized for Fortran 77 with some Fortran 90 support. There's a newer uh, package called FWrap, which is optimized for Fortran 90. And a lot of modules are moving to using FWrap here. Uh, that's really where the Fortran integration comes. Uh, C++ integration is, it's really a matter of just making sure you recognize that sp uh, the Python API is really C, and therefore the NumPy API is really C. Uh, but you can, of course, call C++ code as well if you have the right uh, extern C uh, sections around the right places to put the, those, those correct hooks in your C++ code. And CUDA is the same way. You just have to follow its standards, but then uh, you have, oh, I need to write this, this method or this function call, and you can do it in whatever language you like. So it's, uh, and, and some of that's made easy, and some of it is more manual. You have to do it yourself. Fortran is very easy to use with NumPy and Python. So tell us, you said one of the, you mentioned a couple of the goals of what's coming in 2.0, but uh, tell us what else is coming in, in 2.0. What's on the to-do list? Yeah, that's great. So NumPy 2.0 uh, really came out of a realization that to add date time support to NumPy arrays so that you can have a NumPy array of dates and times uh, required a change to the low-level uh, application binary interface, or ABI. Uh, and all that means is in order to use this, you'd have to recompile your extension against the new NumPy. There's a desire not to have uh, a standard version, a major version, require recompilation. So that necessitated that the date time work, which was started really over a year ago, has to be put into NumPy 2.0. Well, in the meantime, a lot of other ideas have surfaced, uh, things like um, restructuring the UFUNCs to be centered around an iterator, a unified iterator. Uh, this is great work that Mark Weeb has been doing. I'm really excited to see where that will go. There's some... Um, there's definitely some refactoring that could have been done. The UFUNC structure really hasn't changed in the six years that NumPy has been out there. Um, and it, you know, it was definitely kind of pushed together rather than uh, really well designed. Uh, there was a lot of design work that went into it, but uh, you know, when you're kind of operating under, under the gun, you, get, you do a lot of things just to get it done. Uh, and he's taken the opportunity to create new structures at a lower level and then have the universal functions up on top of that. So I'm excited about what that will bring. Uh, the date time support is one. Uh, it's, it's a little unclear how much of the new ideas that are out there will actually get into NumPy 2.0, but some of the things people are thinking about are uh, deferred evaluations, um, basically uh, a pointer a data type. Uh, I should say more about data types in order for that to make sense. But um, So new data types, new ways to calculate, uh, particularly for lazy evaluation or faster evaluation. So tell me a little bit more about the, the, the data types that are exported and the abstractions that are exported by, by NumPy. Why is that useful and, and how are they good things? Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, NumPy is a very generic data structure for uh, low-level data. Uh, you have a data type, essentially. I mean, what, one of the things NumPy can be thought of is as a homogeneous collection of, of bytes that are then described by another object called a data type object. Uh, these data type objects can range from anything from a, a Boolean object to a complex number uh, to a structure of complex numbers plus strings plus a Unicode character uh, plus a, a lot of other basic data types. Really, anything you can do in C, any kind of data type you can, you can create in C, uh, you can also create a, a data type description that allows an, a NumPy array of that type to exist. One of the ways this is really powerful is you can imagine any kind of binary data format from years gone by that you've stored on disk. NumPy provides the ability to describe that binary data format using this data type object. And then you can memory map that whole disk file into memory as a NumPy array. 
and then use NumPy's uh, slicing capabilities or field extraction capabilities to really do uh, access just the parts of that array that you want uh, instead of reading the whole data into memory in a very, very uh, simple way. We've seen this used many, many times to really uh, speed up both conceptually how you get data from disk into memory as well as the processing time because you end up only looking at the parts you care about instead of reading all this other uh, data into memory first. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the NumPy community? Uh, roughly how much of the code is external contributors and how much of the code is uh, provided by NThought? Um, so it's a good question. NThought really has it doesn't have much to do with the actual code of NumPy. Um, I wrote a lot of NumPy uh, before I joined NThought and have tried to keep up while I've been at NThought, although I found that working full-time does make it harder to contribute to an open source project. And we've actually seen that in multiple projects. Uh, people do a lot of work on the project while they're students uh, or in an academic position. And then if they're full-time working, they tend to have less time and less contribute contributions. But uh, as I moved to, NumPy, to NThought, a lot of other folks stepped in and uh, have added significant contributions. Uh, Charles Harris, Polly Vertanen, David Kornapu, and most recently... I'm hoping that some of the work that Mark Weave has done will get into uh, NumPy. Uh, Ralph Gomers has said it has stepped up to actually be a release manager to make sure things get out on time. So it's only the work of those folks that makes NumPy, the NumPy project, move forward. Um, I did a lot of work early on. I mean, probably a year and a half of my life, probably 40 hours a week, uh, to go from numeric Python to NumPy. Uh, but since then, I, I haven't had as much time, and lots of other folks have stepped in to keep the project moving along. Uh, so it's it's definitely a uh, a lot of discussion takes place in the NumPy discussion list, and uh, it's a it's lively discussion. Uh, it's a great place to ask questions about NumPy. It's uh, all, you also get a lot of uh, good ideas that are passed back and forth and debated. So it's a lively community and definitely a community project. And thought itself, we we just try to support it by sponsoring the SciPy conference, uh, occasional sprints, and uh, we certainly have hired a few people in the in the community. So just out of curiosity, a question I like to ask a lot of uh, open source software projects is, uh, what uh, repository system do you use for version control and, and why? It's a great question. So we recently moved from Subversion, uh, hosted basically on NThought servers. NThought provided the Subversion repository. We recently moved to uh, GitHub uh, to use Git. And that was after quite a long debate and some discussion and I guess the reason we ultimately moved to Git is because the primary contributors were really excited about Git and the, the distributed version control that it provided. Uh, and, well, and you know, we had two options, basically, Git and uh, HG, Mercurial. And most people had more experience and liked the speed of Git and then, of course, GitHub as a social coding community. So we just recently moved there about four months ago. Uh, we're in the middle of trying to get the SciPy project over to GitHub as well. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see how the community responds to that move. So you mentioned mailing lists and things like that. Uh, where can NumPy be found? Where can the mailing list be found? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, SciPy.org, if you go to www.SciPy.org, that's really the community site for SciPy, NumPy, any of these things. And on that site, there'll be a, a, a page on the, on the left-hand side that'll show you like, it's developer zone. Uh, they're also maybe on the front page, a little box that shows you how to subscribe to either the NumPy discussion mailing list or the SciPy user mailing list or the SciPy development mailing list. Uh, NThought does uh, sponsor all of these uh, projects uh, to the degree we can. We've hosted the, the data on our servers for a long time. We're continuing to sponsor the SciPy project, the SciPy conference. Um, we try to organize it around the scipy.org site, uh, which is really a community-driven site. I have to emphasize that even though NThought does uh, provide some financial support for this, we don't direct it. It's very much community-directed. Okay, Travis, thank you very much for your time. Uh, this show will be up soon, and we will talk to you or possibly some, one of your coworkers later about SciPy. That sounds great. Appreciate Thanks, that. Thanks, Travis. Yep. All right. Thanks, Brock and Jeff. 